when I was a kid, I, we had an aquarium in my town, and I spent a whole summer playing catch with this dolphin. Every day I would sit and play with this dolphin and play catch with him. And I swear to God, the dolphin, they're such intelligent creatures, it's just like telepathically talking to me. When you hang out with dolphins, it's so incredible. Mystics say that in Atlantis, they kept dolphins as domestic pets, that they had a, a, a kindred relationship. I want to be brought in alignment with a culture who had respect for nature. Such sanity in nature, it like calms down the sympathetic nervous system. It like makes sense. The higher teachings, the wisdom all throughout the ages, they're all saying the same thing. It's not like it's a great secret. There's the real you, and it's not about a body. Let's listen to the wisdom keepers who've been saying the same thing for thousands of years. You've cleared out the garbage from your mind to see reality. Every civilization all throughout history has been predominantly wrong in their theories about the past. They understand the last 10,000 years, but I think you go back 25,000 years and there was an advanced civilization that we're missing. I'm taking a mythological comparative analysis look at all these different sources and distilling it to a point that's creating an alternative view of history that you may or may not believe, but that my intuition and gut as a researcher is just it makes my hair stand up when I piece this all together. We're in Asheville, Massachusetts in Western Mass, and this is Bug Hill Farm. It's an organic fruit farm. There's blueberries, raspberries, currants. People come pick your own. You know, I rented big houses. I had money, I lost money. It didn't really ever change my level of like anxiety and the the way that we're told that life is supposed to pay off for us never paid off for us. So I just, as an experiment, I said, what would it be to like get rid of most of my possessions, live in a small place, reduce my debt, and not be concerned with that? Essentially, I try to slow everything down and that, that peace of mind is invaluable so I can do what I love to do. This is my space. This is Bug Hill Farm. I used to have a big office in town, but I, you know, I just downsized. I studied Native American stonework around the country, and we know Native Americans lived in Deerfield, Mass, almost 13,000 years ago at least. They just did a new archaeological dig near Mount Sugarloaf. So I believe the natives came to these hills uh, for thousands of years for hunting, for ceremonial purposes. And uh, I was always intrigued by some of the structures I found in the woods. Just reading through old county and town histories and Smithsonian ethnology reports, looking for Native American stonework, I started to uncover all these bizarre giant skeleton accounts, these burial mound um, excavation accounts that were reporting, you know, seven and eight foot tall skeletons, sometimes larger. I was like, whoa. And these are respected people. They're measuring a stationary object. It's lining up with like all these other sources of information like the Freemasons, the Rosicrucians, um, oral traditions around the planet, the Bible, religious documents. All the great explorers came, they encountered giant native chiefs like seven, eight foot tall, like Tuscaloosa in Alabama. And the testimony of professionals all around the country for like a hundred years. And you know, it really strikes you. All around the world, there's this mythology about giants, why? This is a Smithsonian Ethnology report from the uh, late 1800s. And what you see here are, uh, you know, arched burial mounds and skeletons and reports of, um, you know, seven and eight foot tall skeletons lived in these old accounts by the Smithsonian's own scientists. Utterly fascinating. And then I got together with other researchers like Hugh Newman, Mikey Ewers, Ross Hamilton. Together, we all put together over 1,000 accounts of seven foot and tall skeletons that were excavated in burial mounds. Um, and tombs in the United States over like 150 year period. It's, it's just stunning. And then you get into the religious documents. The Bible is littered with, with, with giant accounts. Six fingers and six toes, the giant of Gath, Samuel 2120. Then there's petroglyphs all around the United States that have six, you know, giant hands and feet with six fingers and six toes. And then the Americans have legends about that. Then you get into the esoteric sources. Rudolf Steiner, Edgar Cayce, Madame Blavatsky, the Rosicrucians and Freemasons 
all talk about giants as a reality and that they were part of the population of the lost continent of Atlantis. And it sounds like, you know, somebody slipped me some acid, but I am just doing a comparative analysis of all these documents, but they're all saying the same bizarre thing. So taken all together, you know, well, 1,500 accounts right now of seven foot tall skeletons. As an objective, open-minded person, is it worthy of further investigation? That's what I say. That's the tooth they found at the Denisovan cave, 40,000 years old. It's so large, they thought it was a, a bear cave tooth, and they brought it to the Max Planck Institute, and they figured out it's a new species of hominin that mated with Neanderthals and with modern humans 40,000 years ago. So it's a, it's a total anthropological curveball. Is this part of the giant story? Is this like a genetic link to giants in the past? We want to find the truth. We have over 250,000 miles of stone walls in New England. That is from here to the moon. That's outrageous. And I'll tell you, building those walls is not easy. These are some of the walls we've been rebuilding. Here's one of a bunch of towers that we built around town. The birds like it. You know, been rebuilding these walls for a couple of years and I want to do, basically turn it into like a state park. You know, it changes the mindset. It's like planting flowers or something, but with stone. So that's kind of the impulse, is just to like share what we love to do with everyone. It encourages people like, yeah, you know, maybe I want to clean up in front of my house, or maybe I want to think differently how I spend my time, you know? So everybody's dealing with something. It's like, what do you do with that? You know what I mean? Everybody has their issues. If you incarnate in a body, it's so challenging in this dimension to be. So stonework really helps with that for me. It's like self-reflection and consistent effort. And that's what this represents. <laughs> it's maybe not self-reflection, but consistent effort, you know, to create something like this. Quite a place. Initially, I got interested in burial mounds and geometric forms and Native American construction uh, in the eastern half of the country. There was over 100,000 burial mounds in geometric form, sometimes 100 foot high ones like at Cahokia, massive, incredible construction projects. Then I got into the actual nuts and bolts archeological record that talked about what happened when the scientists, say from the Smithsonian and other institutions in the late 1800s, dug into these mounds. And it was staggering, the most amazing reports. You have an archway within a burial mound and a skeleton buried in the middle. And you have that for so many of these, these structures, these massive burial mounds, sophisticated stonework. And oftentimes, like a king or a queen of the Adena people, who were one of the, um, the original mound builders that started around 1000 BC in the Ohio River Valley, they, they elongated their skulls, which is another strange thing. They had massive jaw bones, massive bone structure. They were like NFL linebackers who were over seven foot tall. It's like, where does that come from? Is that, a, is that an anthropological or an evolutionary cur curveball? That's not supposed to be part of the game. You know, it's worthy of investigation, that's for sure. Yeah, as you see, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's a remarkable stone construction that's part of the heritage of the people who lived here, whoever they are. I found accounts in the old records that say, we just showed up here, like at Gungiwamp in Pequot, uh, in Connecticut, and there's a strange stone fort built all of stone, you know, in the native style of, of no mortar, things like that. So there's a lot of clues. It's, it's perplexing, you see, that's quite an impressive drive to create. I was in here in 2010 and the equinox came up, spring equinox, sunrise, and it came right through the center of this. And I'm like, wow, that's either a colonist who loves the equinox or is it, you know, more to the story? At the very least, it inspired me to, to probe further into the mystery.
you have these two stack columns, then you have 12 interlocking massive stones that are organized and oriented to sit on these columns. So this is like a lot of planning and thought. And look at the size of some of these roof stones. And up in Vermont, there's a 20 by 10 chamber called um, Calendar 2. It's oriented to the winter solstice sunrise and the seven three-ton stones on the roof. But some of these stones are really, really quite impressive and large. See this right here? You know, it's really good engineering. So it's just another stunning anthropological twist. It's just a shitload of work and a lot of thought and engineering. Yeah, I don't even know, like... A native elder told me that there isn't a lot of difference in native culture between the extraordinary and the mundane. You know, it's kind of all the extraordinary, all the divine, if you will. Evidence will tell and science will answer it, but uh, just another good mystery. The number one day, my brother and I, we, we missed school because it was a snowstorm. My father was reading these old pirate stories from Edward Rowe Snow around Boston Harbor and shipwrecks. It just resonated with me. I, mean, I love a mystery. That's what I find interesting is like being a detective and figuring it out.